Yep, so my 135, um, I was going to talk about briefly on the imaging in normal pressure hydrogen floods. So just um, a very brief overview, so normal pressure hydrogen floods, as you all know, remains a pretty controversial entity with often ambiguous uh, imaging findings, but there's a recent paper out um, with some international guidelines which I can go over. So normal pressure hydrogen floods was first described in the 60s. Um, as a sort of triad, a triad of gait apraxia, cognitive decline dementia, and, con and incontinence. Um, and as the kind of um, syndrome says, should have normal CSF pressures in the context of dilated ventricles. And often um, in day to day life, the challenge is often balancing the surgical risks against the potential benefits of the CSF diversion, particularly because the patients are, are old and more often than not frail. CT and MRI are both uh, as good as each other in um, confirming dilated ventricles, but MRI is probably better in looking at some other features which I can talk about and also in ruling out um, other um, etiologies. So key imaging features. <clears throat> so um, first feature that, that should be there for a diagnosis of normal pressure hydrocephalus is ventricular enlargement, which is not entirely attributable to cerebral atrophy or congenital enlargement. Um, and the papers use this um, entity called Evans Index, which is here. Um, and there are multiple ways that you can calculate it. Um, but these are the, the two most common. So essentially, you want to divide uh, B to C, which is the maximum width of the frontal horns, um, against A to D, or a similar measurement, which is the frontal horns B to C against the widest part of the brain, which is E to F. Um, and if it's above 0 0.3, that would be consistent with ventricular enlargement. Um, as an aside, other features you can get with regards to ventricular dilatation is often crowding at the vertex, um, which is often disproportionate to the more lateral um, subarachnoid spaces, such as the sylvain fissures. Um, and most importantly, number two, there shouldn't be any obvious other cause uh, for the obstructive CSF flow. In addition, you should have one of the, these other uh, features. Um, so the first one should be enlargement of the temporal horns, um, not entirely attributable to hippocampal atrophy, um, which you can see here. And in the lots of the guidance mention that um, greater than six millimetres would be consistent. Um, you should also have a colossal angle of 40 degrees or greater, which you can see here. Um, this is an angle here, 42 degrees and 73 degrees. Um, and there's more evidence that shows an angle of greater than 100 is more consistent with um, other forms of new neurodegeneration, such as Alzheimer's. That's mainly because you get hippocampal atrophy. Um, thirdly, there should be evidence of altered water brain content, um, which you can see on CT and MRI, which shouldn't really be attributable to other causes. So you can see that here um, on these two different planes on MRI. Um, and finally, there should be an aqueductal or fourth ventricular flow void on MRI, um, which you can see here. I don't know if my pointer works, um, but you can see this kind of black mark between the third and fourth ventricles, which is a flow void. And often in MRI, um, it's a loss of signal, which is correlated with hyperdynamic CSF flow. Most importantly, probably for us, um, is that these two um, top options, so enlargement of the temporal horns and a greater close angle of heart degrees has been shown to have a favourable prognosis um, when the patients go for CSF diversion. And that's me.